I mean, voters are angry, members are angry, increasingly you hear that leaders are angry about how the place actually works. Yes. So it seems like the incentives are there that we should all come together, mm -hmm. talk about issues that we're all upset about, and even find some common ground on things that we can actually make the place look, work better. Mm -hmm. So why doesn't that happen? Well, why doesn't reform happen in Congress? Right. I think it's one is because most people have this idea that congressional reform is going to happen uh, through reasoned argument mm -hmm. and sort of like uh, philosophical debate about how, how our Congress should be run. And that would be nice mm -hmm. if we could just sit around a room like this, discuss how Congress should be formed and implement it, but that's really not the reality of the situation. The reality is that any kind of reform you're going to propose that has a long-term benefit perhaps for Congress is going to be judged by members on its instantaneous uh, effect on public policy right issues. Now. Yes, and right now. And so short-term incentives need to align with long-term incentives in order to get, you know, kind of congressional reform that maybe an outside observer would want to blast in there if they, mm -hmm. if they were a monarch or something like that. And so you have to get those incentives to line up, and often they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, anytime you're talking about making structural changes to Congress, whether it's strengthening the committee system by getting rid of term limits for committee chairs in the House, for instance, or you're talking about strengthening the leadership by weakening the committee system, those might have wonderful kind of philosophical benefits or right. normative advantages, but almost any member who's considering voting on these, either in their party or on the floor of the House, is going to take into consideration how it affects their immediate interests mm -hmm. as representatives, and that's totally normal mm -hmm. and totally fine. Right. And so what you're really looking for is you're looking for the incentives to align. Mm -hmm. uh, last fall, I thought there was going to be a tremendous opportunity for Congress for a resurgence of congressional power because I thought a Republican-controlled Congress in the face of a Clinton presidency right. was fin finally going to have the incentives aligned to snap to and really beef up congressional power and really take on the executive. Mm -hmm. Of course, Clinton didn't win, uh, but I still think that uh, we're seeing some of that in that, uh, you know, this didn't start with President Trump, but right. the post-9-11 uh, buildup of the executive branch mm -hmm. Uh, both in authority and both in capacity over things like homeland security, uh, foreign affairs, the AMUFs, uh, is finally coming home to roost, I think, you know, 15, 20 years later, where we may have uh, President Trump pushing it over the edge and, and convincing congressional actors that not only is it a long-term good for Congress, but in the immediate short term, it would be good to start to reel in the executive. That would take Republicans going against a Republican president. That's, sure. uh, that's, that's so far over the edge that they are in a some sort of position that it's electorally more unsafe for them not to reign in the executive. Trump is so unpopular that they don't respond to him that then they must take action as an institution. Yeah, I mean, I think getting getting members to, to think about their institutional incentives yeah. is, is very difficult. It's particularly difficult in the age of strict partisanship. But you can already see it around the Hill in, in a number of different instances. Of course, we talked about the, the sanctions vote, which right. is clearly an institutional vote right. against the president. Uh, you see it in... Uh, the amendments in Appropriations Committee to get rid of the AUMF. Mm -hmm. uh, now, that was stripped out by the party leaders, but you saw an appetite in a Republican-controlled committee to reconsider kind of this blanket authority the president's had since 9-11 mm -hmm. uh, over the AUMF. And on specific issues, you've kind of seen it come back in a roaring way uh, when the administration through the White House said that they were not going to respond to oversight requests from committee minority members. Yeah. Uh, Senator Grassley sprang into action immediately and not only sent a terse letter demanding that the executive branch respond to uh, all members of the committee, but really uh, laying out a, a really strong case for bipartisan oversight and the need for the executive branch to respond to Congress as an institution. Right.